And welcome back to a new video on the Essex Boys case. As always, if you are enjoying the content, please do give the video a thumbs up. And if you're interested in the Essex Boys case or simply true crime in general, don't forget to hit the subscribe button below. And in this video, we're going to be taking a look at a police statement which indicates just how important it was that Tony Tucker, Pat Tate and Craig Rolfe were killed on Wednesday the 6th of December 1995. Once I've read that statement out to you, I'm then going to share some of my own thoughts on why I believe that the approximate time of death put forward by the prosecution, as in just before 7pm, is most likely accurate. The following statement is from William Theobald, dated the 11th of December 1995. I am married and have two children aged 30 and 23 years. I own half of the land of White House Farm and the bungalow called Rowins, which is adjacent to the farm on the main A130 Main Road, Rettenden. There is approximately 11 and a half acres of land attached to Rowins' property. About 12 years ago, I joined Progress House Gym, which is in Castle Lane, Hadley, Essex. I use this gym for the purposes of bodybuilding. During this time, I met another user of the gym called Tony Tucker. I have trained with Tony in the past. I have collected him from his house to take him training. I would say in those days I regarded Tony as a friend. When I knew Tony, he was a carpenter living with his wife and I believe two children in Rayleigh, Essex. I am also aware that Tony worked for Nigel Ben the boxer and was controlling doorman for various clubs. At one time he had a shop in Romford selling bodybuilding equipment. He either owned this shop or was the manager. I remember whenever Nigel Ben was boxing, Tony would lead him into the boxing ring. Tony left his wife and drifted away onto other things. I have heard that he became involved in the drug scene, although I have never had any personal contact with drugs or ever seen Tony with them. I haven't seen Tony for about 10 years to actually speak to, although about 5 years ago I did pass him on the road in Hadley. We acknowledged one another and then went on our way. I believe Tony was driving a convertible XJS Jaguar. I'm still a member of the Progress Gym, I go at least once a week, but I've never seen Tony training. Since those early days, I cannot recall Tony ever visiting my home address or the farm, I've lived here for 30 years, but I'm sure he knew where I lived. Another friend who I've trained with in the past is a Paul Wheatley. Paul was friendly with Tony Tucker. I was Paul's best man at his wedding. Paul has visited my home on many occasions and I would have assumed that he would have told Tony where I lived. I am also aware of a person called Pat Tate. I may have unknowingly met Tate at the gym, but I have friends on Canvey Island who had their car stolen by this man. I am also aware of the name Tate through car dealer contacts again in the Canvey area. I have never been officially introduced to this man and I am not aware of Tate ever visiting my home or White House farm. Both my brother Peter and I are competent sporting shooting enthusiasts. We have both shot for England and have been able to introduce this facet of our sport into our livelihood. We run White House Farm shooting ground which is as follows. The farm has a lake which is used for duck decoy and fishing. The farm also contains a pheasant shoot. Peter looks after this side of the business. I run the shooting ground which is separate from the farm and contained in the 11.5 acres of Rowan's land. This is a private ground which I supervise and run to give tuition and have a down the line and compact sporting setup. The shooting ground is set up for sporting smooth bore shotguns. I also have an arrangement where I can supply shotgun cartridges to my customers. I currently stock two types of cartridge. They are the Express 24 7.5 colour mauve and the Champion range from Kent cartridges sized 7.5 colour red. It is not uncommon for people who use my shooting ground to bring their own cartridges. I currently only shoot on a Wednesday, up to about 18.30 hours. On Wednesday the 6th of the 12th 95, the shooting stopped when it became too dark. I estimate the last shots were fired about 15.45 hours. I do have lighting facilities to allow us to shoot after dark, but on the above date it was getting cold and the last visitor had an interest in our lakes, so we went on to discuss my pond which is beside my home. I am obviously aware of the shooting incident which occurred on our land just off of Workhouse Lane, the last time I visited this area was on Monday the 4th of December when I walked across the land and up to Rettenden Hall at around 8am when I had a job to do for Mr Foe, the occupier. 
At this present time I have three over under 12 bore shotguns and two rifles. Should the police wish to inspect these guns I am prepared to hand them over. I should also say that having finished the shooting on Wednesday afternoon on the 6th of December I remained at my home address all evening. I did not hear or see anything unusual. Ok, now the part of the statement that we need to focus in on here is the following. I currently only shoot on a Wednesday, up until around 18.30 hours. Now we know that the day that Tucker, Tate and Rolf were killed, the 6th of December, was in fact a Wednesday, and according to the official version of events, they were killed shortly before 7pm. Now, having been armed with this information, the fact that they only shot on a Wednesday, it wasn't like they shot on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Thursday, Wednesday, Friday, or whatever, it's one day a week. To me, this murder had to take place on a Wednesday. And what better time to commit the murder than shortly after the shooting would normally stop. Now, having read this and now understanding that they literally only shot there one day a week, which happened to be a Wednesday up until around 6.30pm, it's pretty clear that this murder had to take place on the Wednesday. It couldn't take place at any other time. A lot of people have said, you know, including myself, surely it wasn't, you know, the greatest idea to do it in the snow or with poor visibility or the fact that you may have left footprints which you could have frozen in place for people to find the next day. Well, they didn't choose that, did they? They had to do it on the Wednesday because it all had to tie in with the normal sort of runnings of the shooting club. That's why the neighbours didn't report hearing anything because it was normal on a Wednesday to hear gunshots up until around that time period. In my mind also, it completely discredits Billy Jasper's version of events and any real sort of theories that this crime took place around midnight or the early morning or any other time later than say 8pm. It's quite clear when you put the pieces together here that this has been chosen for a specific purpose. Do you really think they would have gone out in those weather conditions, the icy roads, the cold, the bloody poor visibility, if they didn't have to. But they had to, didn't they? Because it was a Wednesday. Whatever the road conditions, whatever the weather conditions were on that Wednesday, it didn't matter. They had to go through of it on the Wednesday at rush hour, just after the shooting would normally stop. If you look at it another way, what purpose would it have served for Tucker Tate and Rolf to have been down that lane at midnight? What purpose would it have served anyone luring them down there during that time? You can, you can say, obviously, it would be quieter during that time. There would be less people to possibly witness the murder. But when you look at the normal runnings of the gun club, you can see a lot of motive behind why you would want them there at around 6.30 to 7pm. The shooting happens on a Wednesday. They hear gunfire. It's completely normal. It ties in with all the surrounding area. No one's going to call the police and report it because it's just a normal sound of a shotgun, which they always hear on a Wednesday. It all makes perfect sense. Whoever's planned this crime, whoever's committed this crime, certainly had a great knowledge of this gun club. Maybe the killer wasn't a member of the gun club itself, but they certainly had an associate who had a great deal of knowledge about the comings and goings of White House Farm and the shooting range. It also makes me question the telephone call, which was supposedly the telephone call to arrange the whole meeting for that evening which took place shortly after 2pm to Tony Tucker. Now, if you had gone to such lengths to choose this location for that specific purpose, that it had to take place on a Wednesday, it had to be after half past six, but not too late on in the evening, why would that phone call to arrange the meeting only take place four or five hours before the murder itself? Surely this is something which was planned well in advance. To me, I get the impression that Tucker, Tate and Rolf or at least Tucker and Tate, knew that they were going down that lane way before the 6th of December. I don't believe, I don't really buy into the fact that it was this massive rush job. Okay, let's just get them to some random lane, have someone hiding in the bush and shooting them. Clearly, when you look at all the evidence here, this has been incredibly well thought out. So to summarise everything that I've just gone over, in my opinion, this is a clear plan to have the Range Rover down the lane just after half past six. It had to be on a Wednesday. It didn't matter what the weather conditions were like. It didn't matter how easy the job was going to be. They had to be killed on a Wednesday after half past six. To me, this is clear 
This takes away any sort of narrative that Billy Jasper dropped someone off just after midnight. To me, and obviously this is only my own personal opinion, um, for me it doesn't serve any purpose to commit the crime after midnight. For me, there's a real motive here to get that vehicle down there just after half past six on a Wednesday. Personally, I believe this was an incredibly well thought out execution of these three men. Someone who knew the gun club, knew the comings and goings of White House Farm and the shooting range, or someone who was associated with someone who did. And as I just stated there, it didn't matter what the weather conditions were, although it was snowing, although it was sleeting, although the roads were icy, traffic was fairly congested and slow moving, it didn't matter. Regardless of the weather conditions, Tucker, Tate and Rolf had to be killed on the Wednesday after half past six, early evening time. Now, one of the things which I guess concerns me before we finish this video, or at least triggers something in my mind, is if this meet, if this arrangement to meet at the lane or get them to the lane was done at the last minute, as we've been led to believe, then how likely would it have been that one of these three individuals pulled out at the last minute? What happens if they got there, Tucker was missing or Tate was missing? It makes me wonder how long Tucker, Tate and Rolf had known about this planned visit to the lane. Was this simply a call at 2pm to say, we need to meet you later on to show you where this field is? Or had they known about this place for some time? Had they known about this visit for at least a few days? That way ensuring that Tucker and Tate were going to be there. The following statement is from Colin Elsgood, dated the 9th of December 1995. At around 1600 hours on Friday the 8th of December 95, I was on duty when I attended 49 Gordon Road Pitsy in order to conduct a weapon search. Prior to gaining entry to the bungalow, I was carrying out a cursory search of the rear garden when I saw a vent about six inches up an external chimney wall. Inside the vent, I saw a rolled up carrier bag blocking the hole. On touching it, I felt it contained something substantial and requested a scenes of crime officer to attend. Around 1620 hours, DC Hilton attended and after photographing the location, I removed the bag which I now felt contained a handgun. On opening the bag, I saw it was a silver double nine revolver that was loaded with nine rounds of ammunition. I can produce this firearm and ammunition as my exhibit reference CJE-1. I then handed possession of the firearm to DC Hilton. I remember Pat turning up with a friend in another car, basically with two great big holdalls, saying, can you just stick them in the other room? Don't touch them, leave them there until I ring you and bring them with you. It must have been around two hours that I had to wait for him to ring me. It was a real long two hours. And then I had to get a cab and he was really insistent saying, don't let the cab driver hold these bags, you hold them. Don't let him touch them. And they were heavy and I had to go over to Rayleigh and Essex and meet them at a party. And there were guns in there, really big guns. Fair play to Nipper, he came out and helped me. Okay, now what I find interesting about that interview is this apparent need for guns. We already have the Uzi submachine gun, which was borrowed or on let from Mad Mick Bowman. We also have the revolver, which was recovered from Pat Tate's property. And now we have the talk about these two holdalls, two very heavy holdalls with large guns in them being taken to a party in Rayleigh where Tucker and Tate were. It makes me wonder if they were actually at Workhouse Lane for a different purpose other than to purchase or sell drugs or to even scope out a potential airstrip. We then have the following statement dated the 12th of January 1996 from a Mrs. C.J. Evans Firearms Licensing HQ. Inquiry, Mr. Peter Webb. During the course of the telephone conversation with Mr. Peter Webb, he mentioned that he knew one of the people who was shot and killed in Rettendon recently. As I know that one of the persons killed was a Mr. Anthony Tucker, who had recently made an application for the grant of a firearm certificate. I assumed Mr. Webb was referring to him. I of course did not respond in any way to Mr. Webb regarding information, but feel that due to the possible drugs involvement and the interest previously shown regarding Mr. Webb's involvement with drugs, recently questioned at Heath Row, that I should record his comments for your information. Okay, so it would appear here that Tony Tucker 
towards the end of 1995, according to this very short statement here, actually applied for a firearm certificate. So at this point, we have the Uzi submachine gun, which Craig Rolfe picked up from Mick Bowman at the services. This was towards the back end of 1995. We then have the pistol, which was recovered from Tate's property. We've got now this talk of two holdalls with heavy guns being taken to a party where Tucker, Tate and Rolfe were. And now we have this documentation which shows that Tucker was actually trying to legally obtain a firearm certificate. It's at this point now that the story takes a little bit of a bizarre twist, at least in the theoretical sense. Now what we have is the undisclosed telephone call between Bowman and Tucker, which occurred at 1707. Tucker is speaking to Bowman, a man who they have got this Uzi submachine gun from. They are found next to a shooting range. They don't intend to be out for very long because they have this meal booked at 8.30 p.m. Was this just a short trip down the lane to purchase a weapon, stash the weapon and then be off to the meal as planned? It's also worth mentioning that during his police interview, Michael Bowman did admit to being in the Range Rover, not on the 6th of December, but in the weeks leading up to the deaths of Tucker, Tate and Rolf. It does make me wonder about this two o'clock phone call, which was to Timberlog Lane, the phone box at Timberlog Lane. This was supposedly the call to summon them there for the meeting that night or to arrange the meeting for later that evening. But this phone call was handled by Tony Tucker. A lot of people say, well, this phone box was right near Pat Tate's house. Yes, it was. But if you go through the statements, you will realize that around that time period, they were actually at a carpet shop with Tucker settling up an unpaid bill. This carpet shop, as I say, was located on Timberlog Lane, the very same road at which this phone box was located. So make no bones about it, it was Tony Tucker who handled that call at 2 p.m. If you believe this was the call to summon them there or to get them there that evening, it was most definitely Tony Tucker who took that call and arranged a meeting for later that night. So we have this interest in guns, we have the purchasing of guns, we have the moving around of different weapons. We have the submachine gun, we have Pat Tate's pistol, the guns in the hold all being taken to the party. We now have the undisclosed telephone call between Bowman and Tucker at nearly 10 past 5 in the evening, shortly before they are murdered. The very man, in fact, who they purchased or borrowed the Uzi submachine gun from just shortly before their deaths. Is there a link in the fact that they are found next to a shooting range? Is it the fact that they were just popping out briefly to simply purchase a shotgun? Is that why they don't have reams of money spilling out of their pockets? They had around a £1,000 between them. The reason I mention how much money Tucker Tate and Rolf were carrying that evening is because there, are, there is a rumour going around at the moment that they were driving around sourcing product for some kind of upcoming deal. Yet Tate left £6,000 in his property at his home, which was later recovered by the police. And they didn't have, as I say, a great deal of cash on them. Now, it may be the fact that there were never any guns to purchase at the shooting range. But could that be the lure to get Tucker, Tate and Rolf down the lane, particularly Tucker and Tate? Is that the reason that Mickey Bowman then went to prison in later years for firearms offences? Does this explain the 1707 telephone call between Tucker and Bowman? Does that explain the Uzi submachine gun, which was lent to Tucker, Tate and Rolf shortly before their murders? Was there a desire for weapons here? A need for weapons? Were they buying and selling them? What was the need for all of this weaponry? Not only do we have the undisclosed telephone call at 5.07pm, we also have two voicemails, which I'll play for you shortly, of Michael Bowman trying to reach Tucker and Tate on the day that they were killed. Interestingly, not only is Michael Bowman currently serving time for firearms offences, he actually served two years back in 1990 for offences concerning a shotgun. Before we get into the voicemails of Michael Bowman and his latter police interview, are we looking here at the lure for Tucker, Tate and Rolf? Is this how Tucker, Tate and Rolf ended up down Workhouse Lane? 
They were in frequent contact with someone they had purchased a gun from previously, someone who had served time for shotgun offences. They are found next to a shooting range. Tony Tucker knew the brother of the farmer who discovered the bodies on December the 7th. Did Tucker know of White House Farm? Was he aware that they shot there on a Wednesday evening? Is that why they are found with just over a thousand pound in cash between them? And is that the reason that the restaurant booking still remained for 8.30 p.m. that evening? This was simply due to be a very short visit to purchase possibly a shotgun or some other type of weapon. And they simply didn't plan to be out for very long. Now if we take a look back at the restaurant booking, which was for December the 6th, 1995, the reservation time was 8.30 p.m. for Tucker and three other people. This reservation was increased shortly before 7 p.m. on December the 6th from four persons to six. A lot of people will say, who was this reservation for? What was the need to increase the booking size? Who were the other two people who were going to attend on the evening of December the 6th? Now, what I find quite interesting, having gone back over the Bowman Police interview, is that this man actually knew of the Global Netcalf himself. He had been there, in fact, with Tucker in the past. Firstly, let's take a look at the restaurant manager's statements regarding that booking. And then I'm going to play two very short clips from Bowman's police interview where he mentions having attended this restaurant in the past. The following statement is from Gary Jackets, dated the 8th of December 1995. I'm the operations manager of the Global CAF. The company title is First Continental. The Global CAF Romford is situated in South Street. The CAF has been open for about eight weeks. Since the CAF has been open, I've seen a man I know as Tony Tucker in the CAF about two or three times per week. I've known Tony on a casual basis for the last eight years. I've been associated with various entertainment establishments in Essex that Tony has frequented. Over the last 18 months, I've got to know him a little better. Tony was a very valuable customer and was never reluctant to spend money. He was always very polite to the staff who used to fight to serve him due to the tips he would give. He would always turn up for bookings, but if he couldn't make it, he would always let us know. He seemed to call mostly on a mobile phone, but was quite hard to get hold of if you needed to. I believe that Tony booked a table for four persons, phoning on Monday the 4th of December. I do not know who took the booking. Around 1300 hours the next day, I came into the CAF, and I was in a bit of a hurry and went past all the tables without seeing Tony. He came up behind me and tapped me on the shoulder and said hello. I apologised for not having seen him. He told me he had seen me the following night as he had a table booked for 8.30pm. His food was then served and he returned to the table and I could see he was in the company of a young girl, around 19 to 20 years old. She had long dark hair and I believe she was wearing a brown jumper. I did not see them again as I went about my business. For the whole period the cafe has been open, Tony has supplied the doorman on every night of the week. Tony deals direct with our head office, situated at 198 Victoria Road, Romford, Essex. He then pays the doorman. We always have the same doorman, Barry and Kevin. I do not know their surnames. We are linked by radio link to Hollywood's nightclub just around the corner in Atlanta Boulevard so we can get extra doorman quickly. Tony also runs the doorman at that nightclub. Sometimes, shortly before 7pm on Wednesday the 6th of December, I cannot be sure of the time, Tony phoned the CAF and stated that he wished to increase the booking from four persons to six persons for the 8.30 booking, and I told him that was not a problem. We said goodbye and I didn't hear from him again. During Wednesday evening I was busy at the restaurant. I was aware that Tony and his party had not turned up as booked and at 10.30pm we closed the restaurant. Hollywoods and the CAF are owned by the same company. When I spoke to Tony on Tuesday at the CAF and on the phone on Wednesday, he just seemed his normal chirpy self. Have you ever been out with Debbie and yourself and the others? Yeah, we went out with Tony on his birthday. This is the first time we ever went out together, Tony's birthday. Debbie was with me and the girls with us. We went out for something to eat. Um, there's an old fella, Colton, is it, I think? The security man or something? Do you remember where you went that evening? I can't remember now. The Globe or something, that's what I'm saying to you. I'm, I'm lost over here, I really am. 
No, I meant you went to Tony's birthday party. Right, yeah, we get here, we went there, we went out, yeah. And you were with who? With my girlfriend, Debbie. Um, Carlton, Tony, uh, Pat, there was three other girls there. Oh, can't think of all their names and that. Um, we went out and had something to eat in the Globe. Was Craig with you? Craig was there, I think, yeah, and his girl. Now, considering we have the undisclosed telephone call at 5.07pm between Bowman and Tucker, we now have Bowman admitting he'd been there at least on one occasion with Tucker and others to the Global Net CAF. I guess most of you are at least considering at this point that Bowman may have been one of these extra guests. But do remember, we're looking at two extra people, not just one. Now, where this gets a little bit more peculiar is when we take a look back at Donna Jagger's statement. Now, regarding the Uzi submachine gun, which was collected from the services by Craig Rolfe, we're not just talking about an exchange between Bowman and Rolfe here. There's also a mystery third vehicle, a dark green, I believe, Vauxhall Cavalier, which had another occupant in it. So Bowman did not travel alone to that meeting with Rolfe regarding the submachine gun, he was with another party. Let's take a look back at Donna Jagger's statement. The following paragraphs are from a statement given by Donna Jaggers on the 8th of the 2nd, 1996. I was aware that Craig's associates were Tony Tucker and Patrick Tate. During the mid to the end of November 95, I was aware that they had something going on which at this time I am not willing to discuss. Craig told me that he was going to pick up a machine gun with a silencer and ammunition for their business. He told me that it was coming from a man I know as Mad Mick, who comes from London. I do know that this person is Mick Bowman. I asked Craig how much the gun was going to cost, and he told me that it was being borrowed and was going back to Bowman. About a week after Tony's birthday, which was the 17th of November, I went with Craig and others, who I do not want to name, to Hollywood's nightclub in Romford. Bowman was supposed to have met us in the Global Netcalf beforehand, but he didn't turn up. I then met him through Craig in the nightclub. I recall thinking that he wasn't what I had expected. Craig had told me stories about him. He was with a girl who I only know as Debbie. About a week after this, I can be no more precise than this, Craig told me that we were going to meet Mick at the Furrock Services to collect the gun. I went with Craig in the blue Range Rover, F424 NPE, to the services and had something to eat in the Granada premises. I knew that we were supposed to meet Bowman around 1pm, but he was about 10 minutes late. Craig went outside and returned shortly and told me I was to go outside with them. When I got outside, I saw that Bowman was there with a white VW Corrado car and there was another male in an old green Vauxhall Cavalier. Bowman was acting very paranoid, and I took it that he was on cocaine and was acting hyper because of the situation with the gun. I am aware of how people behave when they have taken cocaine, and that is how Bowman appeared to me. Bowman was trying to organise how they should drive off to a different location. Craig then suggested we should lead. The Cavalier should go in the middle, and then Bowman at the end. This only took a matter of minutes. Craig and I then got into the Range Rover and drove onto the A13 and travelled along to the Five Bells roundabout. We then came all the way around the Five Bells roundabout and Craig pulled up onto the Eastern Garages parking area. The Cavalier parked behind us and Bowman parked the Corrado behind that. We all got out and I started to walk away to stay out of the way. I saw a blue-grey holdall come out of the boot of the Cavalier and go into the boot of the Range Rover. The driver of the Cavalier was a small man, around 5 foot 6 inches tall, early 20s or early 30s, of thin build. He had short cropped hair and wore glasses. I did not hear him speak. I am unable to say who took the hold out of the Cavalier, but I believe Craig would probably have put it in the Range Rover because he was impatient like that. Craig called me back to the car and I got into the front of the Range Rover. I recall Bowman got into the back of the car and told Craig that he wanted the Range Rover once he had finished with it. Bowman then got out of the car, and Craig and I drove off and went to Patrick Tate's bungalow in Gordon Road, Basildon. Craig had told me that Tate had spoken with the garage proprietor at Eastern Garages, a man called Barry Dorman, and told him that he had to buy Bowman's Corrado. I was aware that Bowman was going to stay behind at the garage and speak to Dorman about this. I recall seeing the two men walking towards one another when I was in the Range Rover. When we arrived outside Pat's house, Pat and Tony Tucker were sitting in Anna Whitehead's, Tucker's girlfriend's, Suzuki Vitara. 
I cannot remember if Craig had spoken to him on his mobile phone prior to arriving at the house. Tony and Pat got out of the Vatara, and Craig took the holder and the gun from the boot, and all three went into the house. Sarah Saunders was at this time moving her stuff out of the house with the help of two friends. I didn't want to get involved in what was potentially a difficult situation, so I stayed in the car. Craig was in the house for around 10 to 15 minutes, and then returned to the car with the holder and the gun. He put the items back in the boot and then drove to 108 Mill Green where the gun and holdall were put into the loft. On the way from Gordon Road, Craig was saying how pleased they were with it and how much damage it could cause. I did not see the gun at this time. A couple of days later, Craig picked me up from work and told me that Tony, Pat and him had tested the gun. He stated that it was tested over at Tony's fobbing address in the field. He told me that he had cleaned it all and that he had put it back in the loft. He told me that he had cleaned his fingerprints off the gun, as I was concerned about this. The next thing that happened was that Craig, Tony and Pat were found shot dead. I had a lot of things on my mind, but I realised the machine gun was a problem, but I knew that the police didn't know about the Mill Green address, and I thought it would be safe to leave it here. Now what I find quite interesting regarding Donna Jagger's statements, or at least one of the points which I find quite interesting, is the mention here of Michael Bowman or Mick Bowman trying to get Craig Rolf to drive off elsewhere in order to complete the deal. Now this is something that I have surmised in a previous video that the only way that I can see Tucker Tate and Rolf ending up down that lane unarmed is if they were somehow lured to somewhere that they would deem as public, maybe a pub car park or somewhere that they knew well, they met someone that they trusted and then they were ushered off to another location. It appears here that this is what has happened on this occasion regarding the handover of the gun. We have, in Donna Jagger's words, Mick Bowman acting quite paranoid, quite shifty, sort of keen to get Craig to drive elsewhere in order to complete the deal. Another point worthy of discussion is how this deal at the Forex Services concerning the submachine gun how that deal actually took place. We have Donna Jaggers and Craig Rolfe in the Range Rover. We have an unknown male driving a green Vauxhall Cavalier. And then we have the third vehicle containing Michael Bowman driving his white VW. These three vehicles set off in convoy towards the Five Bells roundabout where they eventually reach Eastern Garages where the deal is finalised. Is this what is being described on the evening of their deaths? on the evening of December the 6th, 1995, in Rebecca Carr's statement, where she discusses a Range Rover, a car in front of that Range Rover, and a white vehicle, which the Range Rover appears to be following. The following statement is from Rebecca Carr, dated the 9th of December, 1995. I'm employed by the governors of a grant-maintained school as the head of department. At around 17.25 hours on the 6th of December 95, I was driving my red Vauxhall Astra car from Canvey Island to Malden. I was at the lights on red at the Retterton Turnpike and I had moved on to the roundabout from the A130 from the general direction of Rayleigh. I was in the near side lane of three cars, re I was the third from pole position at the lights. In the centre lane to my offside, I noticed at pole position a white Sierra saloon car which I believe was a C registration. Behind the Sierra was another vehicle that I do not recall, and behind that was a dark coloured Range Rover. The Range Rover was slightly ahead of me to my off side. I could see two heavily built men in the front of this vehicle, and a third sitting in the middle of the rear seat, who was leaning to one side and gave me the impression he was looking at the vehicles ahead. The man in the rear was large build, and I could see that he had his hair cut short at the rear, with clippers maybe, but longer on top. This man had dark hair and wore a dark jacket. One of the men in the front had lighter coloured hair, like a very light brown. I also noticed the passenger and driver of the Sierra were very big built and stocky, as I could see no light between them. They seemed to fill the front of the Sierra. The passenger had his left arm resting on the door at the bottom of the passenger side window. He looked a very smart man in appearance, he gave the appearance of having money. He was wearing a smart expensive looking French coat with epaulettes, and this was a bluey greeny colour with an almost silky appearance. 
There may have been somebody else in the rear of the Sierra, but I'm not sure about this. As the lights changed to green, the Sierra moved off at speed straight up the A130. The vehicle at pole position in my lane turned left to Wickford. The vehicle in the offside lane between the Sierra and Range Rover turned right towards South Woodham. It was immediately obvious that the Range Rover was trying to keep up with the Sierra, as that too went straight onto the A130 ahead. This section of the A130 is on a hill, two lanes quickly merging into one. There is a large arrow on the road indicating for the offside lane to merge with the near side. The Range Rover was struggling to keep up with the Sierra that was by now some distance in front, and I slowed to let the Range Rover in front of me. We moved through the village, the Sierra moving fast exceeding the speed limit which I believe is 40 miles per hour. Then there was another car, then the Range Rover, then me. As we moved down the hill, I could see that the Sierra braked very, very hard, which caused the unknown vehicle, the Range Rover and me, to brake hard. Even though the Sierra had some good ground on us, I was concerned that the road could be icy. The Sierra had its offside indicator working, and it was waiting to turn into the car park of White House Farm. And as soon as the Range Rover saw this, he put his indicator on also. The oncoming traffic was heavy and slow moving, and the traffic allowed the Sierra and Range Rover to turn into the car park. I remember seeing a bluey pickup transit sized truck that had ladders stacked over the cab. I cannot remember if this is the vehicle that actually let them across or was behind the vehicle that did. The car park is part of the farm shop, there is a round silo bin there. I looked to my right and could see the Sierra turning in a wide circle back towards the exit and the Range Rover was turning the same way but in a tighter circle towards the exit. I then moved away in the flow of traffic. At the time I observed these things, it was dark, the visibility was good, and I would describe the weather as a crisp, dry winter's evening. The Rettendon Turnpike roundabout is illuminated during the hours of darkness. I did not see the faces of the occupants of the Sierra, and I only had a partial view of the occupants of the Range Rover. Now, just to make things a little bit more confusing, in Rebecca Carr's statement, she mentions that the car that is second in line, i.e. you have the Range Rover, the next car, then the white car, that second vehicle actually turns off. But then once they're reaching White House Farm, there appears to be a car again in front of the Range Rover before the white vehicle. Those two vehicles appear to turn into White House Farm, potentially because they have missed the turn off for the lane. The picture I get in my mind when reading Rebecca Carr's statement is the fact that the indicators come on very late, they turn into White House Farm, they do a large circle and a small circle back towards the exit, almost as if they've turned their indicators on late, they've missed the lane, they've turned into the car park, they've done a big loop straight back to the exit to turn left then to go back towards the lane in question. It's really what's playing out in my mind as I'm picturing what I'm reading in front of me there with Rebecca Carr's statements. They've overshot the lane, the indicators come on late, the Range Rover's indicators come on after the white vehicle. It's almost as if they're following this white vehicle down there. That white vehicle has overshot the lane. They've turned into White House Farm, done a big loop back to the exit to turn left and then head down the lane in question. Now, in Mick Bowman's police interview, I believe the interviewing officers touch upon Rebecca Carr's statement in an ever so subtle manner. If you remember Rebecca Carr's statement, which we've just gone over, she talks about the Sierra heading off at speed, the white vehicle heading off at speed, the Range Rover trying to keep up. Take a listen in to Mick Bowman's police interview here. Now, this is me narrating what has been written. This is a narration of his transcript from his police interview, but listen to what the police say to him here. It's like a little car front by the roundabout, opposite, on the opposite side. Okay, so you travel there and who leads the way? Craig led the way. What sort of speed were you doing? Well, I don't know. Was it a fast drive down there or a slow drive or... Well, I really don't know. I didn't tear down there. No? One last drive in the Carrada? No. <laughs> No, it wasn't anything like that. You know, I got the car there, I don't know what time it was. He didn't give me the check straight away. And then we take a look at the police interview of Sarah Saunders. Sarah Saunders, being the ex-partner of Pat Tate, one of the three individuals who was killed, 
It's during her police interview that she claims that she was told that they were going to meet up with Mad Mick Bowman on the night they died. DC Norton states, Are you aware that Donna Jaggers has made statements to us? Hmm, I'd heard that she'd been helping with inquiries, yeah. And did you know what the substance of her statement is? Not a clue, no. I mean, she says that they were going to meet Mickey Steele that night. Hmm, yeah, I've heard that. Hmm, I've also heard that. Well, I can't think where I heard it, but I heard that she said they were going to meet Mad Mickey or something, first of all, that you've arrested him on gun charges or something. I think what both confuses and concerns me regarding the investigation into the deaths of Tucker, Tate and Rolfe is just how little questioning Michael Bowman actually receives. A lot of these very important questions are never put to Michael Bowman. The fact that he had knowledge of the global net calf, the fact that the restaurant booking from Tony Tucker was increased from four to six persons, the fact that there's an undisclosed telephone call that the police would have known about between Bowman and Tucker at 5.07pm on the evening of December the 6th. What is equally bizarre is the fact that Michael Bowman isn't even quizzed by the police during his interview with the fact that he is supposed to be the very man who is due to cut up the coke from this incoming deal. He is quizzed about the, the weapon, the Uzi submachine gun. He's questioned about his whereabouts very briefly, but they never touch upon the fact that he is supposed to be the very man who is involved in cutting up this incoming consignment. What I'm going to play for you now are a couple of paragraphs from Donna Jagger's statement which mentions this fact. Then we're going to take a quick listen to the voicemails between Bowman, Tucker and Tate on December the 6th, 1995, followed by Michael Bowman's police interview. The following are paragraphs from Donna Jagger's statement, dated the 14th of the 3rd, 1996. Tate and Tucker were going to use the gun on the man from the firm in order to take the Charlie. I knew they'd made sure the gun worked, but I did not know how far they were planning to go when they robbed the firm. Steele was going to land the plane, and Tate and Tucker were going to take the complete load. It was going to be split eventually 10 kilos each, and was going to be taken to John McCarthy. They had told Craig they intended to rip Steele off by cutting 3 kilos of the coke into 10 kilos of impure. This would have resulted in Tate and Tucker having 27 kilos between them. The remaining three kilos was going to be taken to Mick Bowman, and he was going to cut it for them. I do not know what the arrangements were to get the three kilos to Bowman, or to get the ten kilos of impure back to steel, but by this time I was getting very worried by Craig's involvement, and told him that I didn't want him to have any part in it. Rettenden Hall up there. Looking down onto the crime scene. There it is. All we need now is old uh, Mr. Fearball to come out and um, give us a nice little on the fly interview. Thank you, sir. Well, they've done quite a lot of stuff here, haven't they? In terms of <sighs> overhauling the area, I suppose you, you'd call it. But I think that's where the Range Rover was. I think it was around there. I don't know if I. <sighs> get down like that you can see it does run downhill and a lot of people have problems with you know why was there blood in front of the Range Rover and you, you can clearly see there that it does not so much there but particularly this part does start to run downhill ever so slightly so and that is obviously something I've explained on many occasions now Adam South End Guy Paranormal Adam from that channel did a good video um, going into the little war memorial. Easy for me to say. Um, so I won't do that, but do check out his channel because he's got a really interesting video which takes a look inside these little shelters here. What the fuck was that? Someone with a bloody shotgun, I think. Like that uh, scared the living daylights out of me. Yeah, we can see there. Um, I 
Yeah, very interesting. They've, they've done so much though. It's, it's amazing. If you come here, do check this out. Do remember that this is someone... Harvey, come here. Do remember that this is someone's private property. Um, and do, you know, do be, do be respectful. But I certainly um, would say it's worth checking out. It's, yeah, a very fascinating place. Not just because of what happened here in 1995 or the fact my dog is going for a wander, but because of what they've actually made this into, it's um, really amazing. Because this is just a small village, a very, very small village. Um, yeah, they've really done a lot of work here. Come on, come on. <sighs> I'd love to get in this, but I can't. It's got bloody flowers in it. Go on, Harvey, have a little, have a little ride. But now, back to the Billy Jasper theory again. A lot of people talk about him approaching via that tree line. Um, I don't really want to get into that too much, to be honest. I'm sure uh, there's other people that want to talk about that, but one of the issues I have is the approach from the front of the vehicle and the fact that um, these men were caught by surprise quite clearly by the way that their bodies are found um, and I don't believe a front facing approach to the Range Rover is what we're looking at there by any stretch of the imagination this was this was an attack by someone well they're with someone that they trusted I, I don't think this is just a one-man mission as it were I think that they were caught they were caught completely unawares whether that is Michael Steele and Jack Wombs, whether that is someone else they knew, is for you to decide. A lot of people still ask me, you know, what are your thoughts? What are your feelings on who did it? And the, the truth is I've never really paid that much attention to who is responsible. I believe we're looking at a mystery third party here, someone that I don't know, someone that no one knows, or at least anyone that watches our channel or this channel. A mystery third party along with people that we do know. I mean, can we really discredit Michael Steele and Jack Wombs' entire involvement? Could they have just lured them to the lane? Could there have been someone else waiting for them there? As I say, a mystery third party. Could this have been somehow involved uh, in terms of Michael Bowman? Was there a mystery party connected to him or Darren Nichols? It's not, it's not a case where you can just say, I think it was X, Y or Z. Well, you can. Of course you can. But... It's never been the intention of the channel to work out who the killer is. It's been, for me, just an interest in the case in general, overall. Um, and looking at how the crime was committed, I think that's what I've always found interesting. How it was committed, why it was committed here. Um, how they entered, how they exited the crime scene. And that's pretty much it, really. But you can see there, back in that other shot, that you can see it does run downhill. Now, this, these ditches... Um, these have all been dug since 1995. Um, yeah, but you can see it does run downhill, doesn't it? Yeah. It would be amazing to sort of go back in time to 1995 and have it all sort of shortened, you know, brought into maybe like there, I guess. There, yeah. And, all, and, and although I uh, do appear like a massive tree-hugging hippie, they do interest me for some reason. I've got zero interest in trees outside of this, but the fact that they were there, it's just, I'm sure this one was here. Looks quite, doesn't look that old though, does it? Oh, I don't know, too much tree talk anyway. What I'm gonna do now, um, and as I say, I'm pretty sure this is the spot where the Range Rover was, or just a little bit further down. What I will do now, though, as I say, I don't think I'll record going back up the lane. <clears throat> We're going to go to the small part of the lane here. And then we'll zoom off, almost like time travel, to the uh, Rettenham Parish Hall car park. And um, what I want to do is I want to have a little look around there. I mean, it's only tiny. It'll take me like 10 seconds. But then I'm going to show you how far that is from the crime scene. And I may, I may even tie in... 
um, a statement of what was found in that car park after the murders. And as I say, for one last time, Rettenden Hall up there, old uh, Ronnie Foe. I'm not sure if he still lives there. If he does, he's probably like 110. So maybe that's a little bit, a bit of a stretch. Um, yeah, it's, it's weird, isn't it? You spend all these, all these years looking at this case. And it's almost, it's just hard to picture it happening here. It really is. Just, you, you can't, I find it really difficult to picture the Range Rover just stood there. Tucker, Tate and Rolf in the Range Rover going down here and meeting their demise. It's, yeah. it's weird. It's weird that I feel like there's just no connection to it for some reason. It just doesn't feel like one when you're there. Other people might have different, different experience though. Um, as I say, that's just how I feel when I visit here. But this part of the lane is interesting for my good self. And this hasn't changed since 1995. And you'll know the, uh, the crime scene photographs of this part of the lane, especially when it comes up to here. And you can see it sort of, it's sort of in the crime scene photographs, it sort of bends around. Um, and then you've got the alternative lane, obviously, over there. But that's where the crime scene photographs stop in terms of any sort of investigation into that uh, part of Workhouse Lane. I call it the alternative lane. It is part of Workhouse Lane, but it's kind of got its own name now, isn't it, since my videos. Rettenden Hall again. Hopefully my dog hasn't got onto the bloody main road and uh, decided to go direct in traffic. Hopefully not. They're not, they're not the smartest of animals. Oh, here he goes. Here he is. Chocolate Labs. But yeah, I've always found this quite interesting. This little bend here, which you'd have seen many times on the crime scene photographs. Sort of vegetation, left and right. As I say, largely unchanged to how it was back in 1995. I wonder what they were thinking when they came down here. What were they here for? What was the purpose? Were they just completely chilled out, relaxed? A bit of Janet Jackson on in the Range Rover, you know? And then all fucking hell broke loose, didn't it? So, um, it makes me wonder why, 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 why were they here? All of the sightings of Range Rovers coming down this lane, or not, you know, tons of them, but the odd two or three sightings of, you know, a green Range Rover floating around the area. Harvey. God, don't listen to me. It does make me wonder, what was their purpose? Was this a regular meeting spot? Had they been here in the past? This little cut in is interesting as well because we've seen this on the crime scene photographs a bazillion times. This is where Darren Nichols claims to have been. Spun the car around, waiting here. Mick getting in saying, turn the fucking light off. It's weird, when, you, when you're actually here in person, it's, it's a lot smaller than what it looks on the crime scene photographs, weirdly. It is a lot smaller. But yeah, supposedly turned in here parked up the car lights were facing back towards the main road and then steel and won't supposedly come up from here in the snow Nichols is waiting in this gap here in the car but with no tire tracks matching the vehicle he said he was driving was there some kind of second vehicle waiting here for some reason we have those tyre tracks from a high performance vehicle. Can't for the bloody life of me remember, what, remember what, exactly what they are now. Were they Continentals? Can't remember. Um, was that vehicle somewhere involved? Was it parked up here? Was that the vehicle that was parked there? We can't actually trace those tyre tracks hardly anywhere on the crime scene photographs, which is a little bit frustrating. Right, this way, come on. Have a little walk back down here. What I'll do is I'll pause it then until I get back to the wheat sheaf and then we will, maybe I'll walk a little bit up the alternative lane. 
but coming down here yeah this this does feel weird being here because you can picture it you can picture the sort of narrowness the range rover heading down here what was it what was their state of mind as they came down here were they with someone that they actually fully trusted and they didn't expect a single thing to happen but if they really did trust that person if they really trusted that person would that person have had a strong enough motive to commit triple murder and what i mean by that is was there something that was unreconcilable unrecon is that the word is there something, was there something that they couldn't get past? Something that had happened between these people that caused the triple murders? And if that was the case, if there was something in the past, would they have been wholeheartedly comfortable with travelling down here in the pitch black? Or were they simply, at this point in time, too full of their own ego, too full of drugs, too full of um, their own... I guess self-perceived power to think that anything could ever happen to them was it ego ultimately that got Tucker Tate and Rolf killed they didn't believe that anyone could possibly do that to them who knows oh it does this weird isn't it imagine the Range Rover come, just coming down here taking the right Heading down to what was that lock five bar gate. It's very strange. Exercise ring closed. Well, that's good. Hope you all heard that at home. Keep up the activities. All right, we'll just do a little, uh, little walk back. And then I'm not gonna go the whole way. Put it on pause in a minute. And then I will bring it back up at Rettendon Parish Hall. As I say though, I do find that little bit quite interesting. The fact that that cutting was still there, or was there I should say, back in 1995. And the most interesting part probably, as I say, of the whole place is that original part of the lane. I do find that little bit quite interesting though, definitely. And as I've always said, this part of the lane was this the uh, the route out? Was this the safest exit? Could this have been the safest exit if it was something to do with the Billy Jasper situation? Did he come back up here, exit over that little cutting, or cut through, I should say, and um, make his way back to Rectory Lane? For whatever reason, I think that exiting back out onto that main road, which is a lot busier than what it is today, I just think that that is so risky, parking a car up there just seems yeah it does seem a little bit strange i mean ideally really if you are going to get away and you're really going to put a lot of thought into this you wouldn't really want to go straight back out onto the main road you would want to get out somewhere else even if someone sees you they're not going to necessarily connect you to what's happened i mean rectory lane would be perfect but would some of military expertise as we're led to believe really walk all that way in trainers in the snow that's another question. Would someone with military expertise really wear high-tech or Reebok trainers, whatever they were, would you really wear trainers to walk from Rectory Lane across all those fields in the snow wearing a tracksuit? Would you? I don't know. Hello, Tom. Get the ring, mate. Me, Kate. Hello, Tom. It's a ring, mate, Mickey. Hello, Pat. You mate. It's Mickey. Can you give me a ring, mate? I'm, um, 0973 396 781. Cheers, mate. The following is a narration of transcripts from a police interview conducted on the 15th of the 2nd, 1996. The person in question who's being interviewed is Michael Bowman. This interview is being tape recorded. The time is now 11.09am on Thursday the 15th of February 1996 and we are at the interview room at Chelmsford Police Station in Essex. 
We are investigating the offence of unlawful possession of a prohibited weapon. A record of this interview will be made and may be given in evidence if you are brought to trial. Do you understand? Yes, I understand. I am Philip Bridge. I'm a Detective Constable with the Essex Police and also present in the room is... I'm Detective Constable 744 Michael Brown, also stationed at Police Headquarters. Mr Bowman, if you could introduce yourself with your name please. I am Michael Scott Bowman. Right, first of all, Mr Bowman, when you were brought back from your home address this morning by a uniformed officer from Essex, which is PC 425 Montgomery, and this is quoted as you said it to him, you've been expecting this for the past few weeks. I was in the motor about three. No, two weeks before they were ironed out. I went out for a drink with them. Now, I understand that you've had the opportunity to see that note in the officer's pocketbook and sign it, which you've refused to do. Is that correct? No, I've not seen the note at all. I haven't read them. Right, were you not offered that note? Well, he did offer me a note, yeah, but I mean... Right, so you've obviously confirmed that you were given them to look at. Well, I didn't read them, no. But you either didn't or didn't want to sign them. No, I didn't. Would you care to be given the opportunity again to see that note? Not at this stage, no. Um, I'm not prepared to sign anything or talk about or discuss that at the moment. I want to know why I'm here before we go any further. Right, okay. So if you let me know why I'm here, then I'll let you know if I want to sit here and talk to you and listen to it. Right. Well, Phil's already said, hasn't he, Mr Bowman, what you've been arrested for. The other part that we just want to put to you before we get into the, the full nuts and bolts of why you're here is that when you actually arrived at Chelmsford Police Station, that you were seen by the custody sergeant, and he's got, well, I should say, I've got a copy of your custody record here under reference 454 of 96. And I'm reading from it when it's got the suspect's volunteered comment on detention, and you have been recorded as saying, quote, If this is about the Rettenden business, I was expecting a visit anyway. I was in the car about a week before. Would you like to confirm that as well? Yeah. I would. Uh, I can confirm that. Fine. Okay, that's lovely. It's only just to get what was said recorded down, then we can just check the accuracy with you, if that's okay. Going back to what you were asking us, right, and bringing it up to date on the Thursday, the 7th of December 1995, last year, the bodies of three men were found in a Range Rover, which has got an index number of F424NPE, and this was found at Retton's in Essex. And they'd been shot to death and the identities of the deceased were later established as Craig Rolfe, Tony Tucker and Patrick Tate. Mm -hmm. Now the Essex police launched a murder inquiry into their deaths and during the course of the inquiry it came to light that you knew the deceased. Yeah, that's right. I know of them. Yeah? Yeah. How do you know them? I well, know I'm from prison. I know Pat from prison. And I uh, went and had a drink when he got released. A little while ago. But I mean... I don't sort of associate with them. I know them. But I mean, it's not illegal to have friends, is it? No, certainly not, no. I mean, you know, I mean, if this is what I'm thinking it's about, like I said earlier, the reason why I thought that maybe I'd get a tug is because I was in the car about a week or so before it happened. I went to a club of them in South End somewhere. Club Art, I think it was. Club Art? Yeah, something like that. I don't know. I had a couple of drinks at a couple of places with them. But that was it. I mean, I haven't seen them. Well, I was not anywhere near that place, mate, when it happened. I certainly wouldn't have been involved in their deaths because, I mean, you know, I wasn't against them. If we could just deal with your knowledge of the people to start with, you're saying Pat Tate. Yeah, I knew Pat more than any others, really. Tony was all right as well. Didn't really know Craig. I mean, I sort of knew him. I wouldn't say I was close to them, close buddies and that. But I knew them. I sort of, you know, associated once or twice with them. Went out and had a drink with them once or twice. And what about Tony? How many times have you met Tony? At boxing. I used to see him at boxing quite a bit. With, um, you know, Nigel Ben from, you know, when he was at Tenerife and that. I used to go to Tenerife quite a lot and train. I knew Tony through that, really. I mean, out of the three of them, I would say that I knew Pat more. And I knew Tony was all right. But I didn't really know Craig that well. How many times have you met Craig? Dunno, probably two or three times, I think. Top whack. Do you remember under what circumstances? No, not really, no. I mean, I'd been out drinking and seen him, you know. When Pat got out, he had a little drink, had a little party when he first got out. He'd been out a little while, hadn't he? And did you go to that then, Mr Bowman? Well, I went over and had a drink with him, yeah. I mean, I went out and had a drink with him. Do you remember where that was? I 
couldn't tell you. Um, I'm no good in Essex at all. I'm liable to get lost. Not even the name of the town. Um, no, somewhere Basildon way. Oh, so you knew it was Basildon? Yeah, like, sort of that way, yeah, but I couldn't tell you where it was in that. And could you elaborate as to what was spoken about in the car earlier? Well, I, well, what I said to you, what I said earlier in the car was that I thought that when it was Essex Police, that it had something to do with this, because I thought that, you know, I've got form for firearms, I've done three years for the shotgun, and I'm, you know, I ain't fucking very nice. I thought that maybe, yeah, this is why I'm going to get a tug down. Now, look, I've been in the car, they've got to rule me out, and obviously it's gone out of my head a little bit, because I thought it would have been done a lot quicker than that. But, I mean, you know, you've been in the Range Rover. I've been in the Range Rover, yeah. I think twice I went in the Range Rover, yeah. I sold my car. What sort of car was that? I had a Volkswagen, yeah. Or my girlfriend had a Volkswagen Carada, and I sold it to a car front on the A13, which is the same car front they bought the car from, I think. Because I saw the Range Rover there, and they told me they were going to buy it. I said I wanted to sell the car, and he said, sell it to that fella. So would you just like to expand a bit? I know you said that you've been in the Range Rover twice. How has that come about? Well, I've been, or I met, or I went over there and met them, I think. I met them at a roundabout, because I started to get lost. And I went out for a drink with them. You know, got in the car, the Range Rover with them. We went out. Went to, I don't know, I think it was Raquel's or somewhere like that. Went and had a drink. And who was in the Range Rover at that time? There was me, um, Tony, Pat, a couple of girls. I mean, we was all crammed in it. Um, I think Craig was there as well. There's a couple of birds. Um, they had their girlfriends that, that was with them. And we went out to a club in Basildon somewhere, and then we went somewhere else. I mean, I was drinking, I can't remember all the names of places, but I think that was about a week before it happened. Right, and how did you get to hear about the party? Uh, Pat rang me up, um, I believe. Pat phoned you. Well, Pat would have phoned me, or Tone. They both had my girlfriend's mobile phone number, so if you'd gone through the phone bills, you'd know that they were ringing me from their house phones. So that's why I said I presumed I was going to get a pull down here somehow. So you spoke to them via your girlfriend's mobile phone? Well, yeah, that's how they used to get hold of me, really. Right, and did you have a phone number to get in contact with them? No, no, no. Um, that was the only number. As I say, I live with my girlfriend. So you didn't have a mobile number for any of the three of them? No. Oh, I've got Pat's number. You've got Pat's. And I've got um, his house number as well. I think I've got Tony's number, his mobile. Right. I might have rung them once or twice as well. Have you been to their houses? I've been to Tony's house and I've been to Pat's house. Where was Tony living when you visited him? Um, big place. Can't think of what it's called. Just by the car front where the car was sold. Would that be fobbing? Fobbing, that's it. Yeah. Um, that's where if I'd ever met them, I'd, I'd go there, yeah. I mean, I've probably come over this side and met them probably four or five times. I've come over this end and Pat hasn't been out that long, I don't think, has he? Um, he hasn't been out that long. But I mean, I sold my car because I wanted to get rid of the car. And then we had the stuff with Tony's. Um, that was another time. He said to come over, go and see the fella at the car front, see if you can sell it to him. So did you arrange that on the day that you were going to try and sell the car? What were the arrangements with the people, you know, when you were coming down to Essex then? Well, he just said, come over. He said he knows the fella. Um, he said, just take the car there. And who was the conversation with? Tony. Tony. With Tony? Yeah, I mean, you know. And who did you deal with at the car sales? Oh, I can't remember the fella's name. I really can't. Um, was he a mate of Tony's then? They knew him, yeah. Um, I, I mean, you know, I didn't really have a good deal or anything. I just wanted to get rid of it. For Deb, you know, we've got a little estate now with a dog. And how much did you get for the car? Oh, I can't remember now. I think it was probably about seven grand. And who's uh, who's Deb? Deb. Deb's my girlfriend. That's your girlfriend, right? My girlfriend, yeah. Have you ever been out with Debbie and yourself and the others? Yeah, we went out with Tony on his birthday. This is the first time we ever went out together, Tony's birthday. Debbie was with me and the girls with us. We went out for something to eat. Um, there's an old fella, Carlton, is it, I think? The security man or something? Do you remember where you went that evening? I oh, can't remember now, the Globe or something, that's what I'm saying to you. I'm, I'm lost over here, I really am. Tell us, um, what birthday is this? 
this is um i don't know late last year i suppose i don't know a month or two two months before this happened and this was tony's oh yeah it's tony's birthday yeah and was that the first time that you went with them that was the first time i've been out drinking with them because i knew him through my co-defendant fisher fisher actually introduced me to tone i'm sorry i don't know anything about that well i'm nicked last year over here with two kilos of amphetamine as you know don't you you must know that well, we don't at the moment, Mr. Bowman, no. But so you obviously know if you want to talk about that. Well, I'm telling you, yeah. Well, you know, there's no bollocks here. I mean, is there? I mean, you know, like, I'm here. I mean, I'm telling you what I know. You know, like, I ain't got anything to do with this fucking turnout. I ain't like, you know, it ain't me. I know them. I ain't going to do shit like this, mate. I mean, you know, like, I've had enough of all of it. Fisher and myself, well, I've got in a car with him and he wound up, well, he didn't tell me that something's in the car. And we got nicked for some amphetamine. There's two kilos in the panel of the door. So we wound up going to court. He's put his hands up to it. He said, you know, you told the police exactly what's gone on. I never knew it was in the car. And I was found not guilty by a jury at Chelmsford. This was last year, August, I think it was. That's how I knew. He introduced me to him a while back, about eight months ago. Okay, so he's introduced you. Well, he introduced me to Pat and Tony. Yeah, um, well, Tony more than anything, more than Pat. I mean, I've seen Pat once or twice in prison. And what's the purpose of the introduction? Nothing. I mean, you know, just I just know him. All right. Yeah. So you were saying, so, well, look, look, one way or another, all I was saying earlier was, uh, I mean, I want to know what I was coming here for, you know. No, I meant you went to Tony's birthday party. Right. Yeah, we get here. We went there. We went out. Yeah. And you were with who? With my girlfriend, Debbie. Um... Carlton, Tony, uh, Pat, there was three other girls there. Oh, can't think of all their names and that. Um, we went out and had something to eat in the Globe. Was Craig with you? Craig was there, I think, yeah, and his girl. I can't think of, um, well, unless you know his date of birth, that's what it was. Okay, so you saw them then, how many times after, at Tony's? Well, yeah, well, I think I crashed at Pat's house one night as well. Um, we were drunk then. Um, me and Debbie, we had a drink, you know. I can't think of what night that was. Can you remember the address? We sent flowers there as well. That's um, Pat's little actual bungalow, the one where he had all that ag before. Um, well, yeah, I can't remember. Well, he has got a bungalow, yes. Yeah, yeah, that's right. He was shot there before, wasn't he? That's right, yeah, yeah. That's the place, because I didn't like staying there. I didn't like fucking staying there, to be honest with you. I thought, cool, I'm only going to have a drink sitting in there like that. You know what I mean? Ain't exactly angels that lot. I mean, I didn't really, I mean, you know, you don't realise some of these things going on. And some things that I heard that have been going on really in Basildon with that fucking lot. I mean, you know, it weren't up my street, really. You know, I've got to tell you. What did you hear then, Mr. Bowman? Well, I mean, you know, as I say, some of the things I've heard, I mean, I don't want to go into that, but they weren't good people. Nice people, really. I mean, what's happened to them, mate? It fucking frightened the life out of me. I don't want to know, mate. I don't want to know none of it no more. So what was your reaction when you heard they'd been murdered? <laughs> Shock, mate. Frightened the life out of me. Because he said he was going to give me a ring. He said, we'll go for a drink or something just before Christmas. Then all of a sudden, bang, he's gone. Heard it on the radio, I think. I thought, three fellas in a Range Rover? I was in that Range Rover and I thought, well, that ain't right. Frightened the life out of me. So you've been in the Range Rover? Well, that's what I thought. I thought, I've been in that car when I've been having a drink. I might have been fucking flopped on myself. Frighten the fucking life out of me. I mean, what do you do? So how many times have you actually been in that Range Rover? Well, I think I've been in it once or twice. And were you sitting in the Range Rover? I can't remember. Have you ever driven it? No, no, never drove it. Have you been in the front passenger seat? Well, I think so, yeah. I might have been squeezed into the back as well at some point. Just as a matter of formality, I'd appreciate if you could give us some help on this one. Patrick, Pat, Tony and Craig were murdered on the evening of the 6th of December, which was a Wednesday evening. I appreciate it was some time ago, but can you tell me where you were on that particular time? Um, I'm not sure. Debbie will know. Um, I can't remember. I really can't. Do you keep a diary or anything like that? No, Debbie would remember though, because I think I went, oh, did I? Was I with my mum and dad? Her mum and dad? Her mum and dad come down? I'm not sure. Oh, I'm not sure. I think I had dinner with her mum and dad. I'm, I'm not sure that night. I remember that night I was at home. 
I think they'd come down to see me and I had Charlie. I had my daughter on the sick that day because I was spooked, you know, it spooked me a little bit. And I think I kept her on Wednesday, well, most Wednesdays. I want to just say to you that the bodies were found on the 7th, on Thursday the 7th. Yeah. Okay, in the morning. So what we're interested really is about the night before that. Right. I really can't remember at this stage. I, I can remember the day, I think, when I, well, I think like me, my daughter, my baby come over, I collected her about four. I can't remember that day. Well, obviously, if as you were saying that you were obviously spooked when you heard the news that day, mm -hmm. that uh, does not give you an inkling that you were, you think, call oh, blimey, I've been with them that night, you know, I've been out with them and like you give a bit of a, a clue as to what you were doing. Well, uh, I wasn't out drinking the night before. No, that's not what I'm saying. But when you said you could have been out with them, well, what I'm saying is if I was in the car and I went out and actually had a drink with them, then I was in that car that they were assassinated in. It ain't hard to work out. It's frightening, isn't it, really? I mean, fuck me. I've got form and that, and I ain't no cunt, but I ain't, you know, like, I'm not going to be going out somewhere drinking and being roped into something like that with those lot because I know them. Well, can I just run over a couple of things about your own car that you were saying? Um, at the moment, you're running what sort of car? We've got a little S. Um, I can't drive. I'm on a ban. Oh, OK. Well, I'm on a ban at the moment. My girlfriend's got a little Escort estate we've bought, you know, because we've got a dog now, you see. And when did you get rid of your VW Carrada? Uh, um, well, she'll know all the details, the dates and that, Debbie. Um, my girlfriend, she'll know all the dates. If you want to get specific, I'll find out. But I think it was about a week or two weeks before this, this awful business happened. Okay, and when you sold the car, yeah, um, well, he gave me a check. Did he? Yeah. What, dated? Dated, yeah, he, he dated it and gave it to Debbie. Um, it's written Debbie Ferguson's name, so that's about all confirmed. So how did you go about selling the car? Well, I said to Tone, does he know anyone for it? And he said, yeah, maybe, that he would buy it. So what did you do? Well, me and Debs, we'd drive it over there and he said he'd buy it and wrote out a cheque. It's lovely and we got something a bit cheaper. Because it's a bit too dear to run, plus I was on a band, so... If you took the car over there, then how did you get back home? Oh, I can't remember. I think I got a lift, um, I think, and he gave me a lift back, one of them. Who's that? Oh, I can't remember, hold on. Yeah... Um... I think, I think I've got a lift back. I think Tone dropped me back. In what car? It's, uh, it would have been a Porsche, um, 923 Porsche. Um, got a black Porsche, it's a black Porsche, yeah, we used a Porsche. It was a while back. Can we move on a bit further now to, basically, for the reasons why you are here, shall we say? Right. We've obviously spoken to a lot of people, made a lot of inquiries, as you can imagine, in a murder, a, a triple murder. Right. And various things have come to light. And the one that comes to light that affects you is that you were requested to supply a firearm to the three of them. I was requested? Nah, that's wrong. No way. Who said this then? Bear with me. You were requested to supply an automatic pistol, silencer and ammunition. No, nah, not me. No way. No way. And they were going to use it for their own purpose, which obviously was a unlawful purpose. Look, there's no way that I was involved in it. These people, you know, no way, no way at all. As I've said to you, I've been over there a couple of times, had a couple of drinks with them, crashed at Pat's house once, landed me some clothes and bits and pieces. I ain't been doing no business with these people at all. Not on that side of things. I'm dead certain of that. I mean, I live in Kent. I ain't nowhere near this lot. You say you live in Kent, but it's Bromley, Kent you live, isn't it? Yeah. Which is not a million miles away from Basildon, is it? Yeah, but I mean, like, at the end of the day, what I'm trying to say to you is I don't do no business like this shit with these people. I don't do it. I mean, I may have gone out of them a couple of times, had a drink with them and that, but it shocked the life out of me that this has happened. It's really livened me up, Governor, believe me. This has frightened the fucking life out of me. I certainly ain't involved in supplying firearms to them. I don't supply firearms to anyone. I don't fucking do it. I'm out of all that. Because I've got form for firearms and that, it's not nice to be roped into things like this. I mean, I've been nowhere near it. Nothing like that. If I can tell you that it's not because of any previous convictions that you've been arrested for this, for this matter, it does go a little bit deeper than that. 
and that is that on the date between the middle of November and the date that they got murdered, it suggested that you actually supplied the firearms of Craig Rolf. We also believe that you met him at a service station. No, no way. Have you ever been to the Granada Motorway services at Farrock? Mm. Off the M25? Yeah. And when did you go there? Oh, I can't remember. Well, it's important that you try and remember. I mean, I can't remember. I think I've met um, along them services, one of them services. I think it's the fobbing one, though, when I've met them. I haven't met Craig. I met Tony. What we're putting to you is that you had a meeting with other people as well at those services, and there you had a firearm. I had a firearm that was intended for Rolf, Tucker and Tate. It's intended for them as in to loan to them. No way. No. It's not like that at all. It's just like I said to you, I'm prepared to sit here without my slizzard and tell you exactly what I know. I don't know nothing about what they've been doing. I haven't been involved with them at all in that way. I know nothing like that. But I thought that maybe I was going to get pulled in, you know, for one reason or another, because of my form. And I know I've been in the car. So I thought maybe that, yeah. Just go back to this one supplying of the firearm. The allegation is that you met them at the Forex services and you travelled to the Eastern Garages, the Five Bells Garages, where you sold the car. Yeah, yeah. And there the firearm was transferred from a vehicle into the Range Rover. No, no, no way. No, no way. So why should statements be made to tar? Well, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why. I don't know why they're trying to work me into this. I don't know. Why, have you upset somebody? Not that I know of. Not, not from any of that lot. I don't know. No. Is there anybody in that group who you've had a run-in with? Not really, no. Like I said, I don't really know them that well. I mean, not to stick it on me that way. I mean, I don't know. I really don't know. And the firearm that you are alleged to have supplied was then taken to Pat Tate's bungalow, the one that you've been to. Hmm. Yeah, I said I've been to the bungalow. And there it was examined. No. When you said earlier on, Mr Bowman, that uh, when you dropped your Corrada off at the garage, you obviously had a deal. You talk about selling the car and you've got the cheque that's gone through Debbie's account. And obviously we can check that later on. And you seem to recall that you got a lift back in the black Porsche. Mm. What we're saying is that at that time you had the meeting at the services. On that day with that car, I had a machine gun with me at the Granada services. That's what you're saying. Yes, at that day there was you in your Corrada, there was another person in another vehicle, and them in the Range Rover. And you then went down, all three of you. So you're saying to me that I've gone down there to sell my car with her, and I've taken a machine gun over there with me and sold it to them, is that right? I want to stop this interview right now, until my solicitor gets here, because I mean this ain't on now. I've come down here, I mean, you've dragged me out of my bed, in my dressing gown. No, you just hold on a minute. Can I just finish, please? I've told you exactly what I know. I've done no business with these people. I've asked them to sell a car for me, and he said that the fellow would buy it. So to come on over. I've gone over there, had a couple of drinks with them, but I certainly, definitely did not sell them a machine gun. I'm not involved with these people in that way, and I'd rather talk to my solicitor now and get some advice and stop the interview. Okay, Mr Bowman, as I said at the start, you are quite entitled and arrangements will be made. So the time now is 11.35. We're going to stop the interview so you can seek legal advice, okay? Thank you. Okay, but just before we do stop it, this isn't evidential, Mr Bowman, but what I'd like to do is give you a copy of this form, which is the A405, which explains your notice of how to get hold of the tape. Okay, so I'm going to give that to you now and you can read that at your leisure. Okay, thanks. Okay, the interview is now being terminated. This interview is being tape recorded. The time is 16.11. That's 11 minutes past four in the afternoon on Thursday the 16th of February, 1996. And we are in the interview room at Chelmsford Police Station. We are investigating the offence of unlawful possession of a prohibitive weapon, which is contrary to the Firearms Act. A record of this interview will be made and may be given in evidence if you are brought to trial. Do you understand the reason for your arrest? Yeah, that's fine, I understand. Okay, my name is Philip Bridge. I'm a detective constable stationed at police headquarters. Also in the room is Michael Brown, detective constable 744, also stationed at headquarters. Okay, Michael, if you could introduce yourself. Michael Scott Bowman. Okay, now I'm going to caution you now and say that you do not have to say anything, 
but it may harm your defence if you do not mention when questioned something which you later rely on in court. Anything you say may be given in evidence. Do you understand? Yes. Right, Michael, we had an interview earlier this morning and you asked us to stop whilst you sought legal advice. Are you quite happy that you've had enough time to take legal advice? Yeah, yeah, I've had some legal advice. This morning we had a discussion about your knowledge and relationship with three persons. That's Mr Tate, Mr Tucker and Mr Rolfe, who were subsequently killed. Is that correct? Yes. At this stage, we don't wish to develop that any further. But we would like to do is to discuss with you the reason why you're here. And as we indicated this morning, the allegation is that you are responsible for supplying them with a firearm. Yeah. Okay, so you've had some time to think about what we said and what we spoke about earlier. Is there anything that you wish to add? Well, basically, from what you're telling me, you knew that I met Craig in Forex Services. You told me that that's where I met him in the services, but that was the day that I sold the car. I met him over there to sell the car. I told you that earlier. I took the car round to the car front. Craig then gave me a lift back to Pat's house to see Tony. I think as it goes, I had a bit of a dispute about the check. He already had two cars out on bail with Pat. They bought a Merc and a Range Rover, if I remember rightly. Um, so I've been seen over that way on that day, and it's because of that. I went round there, discussed it. I mean, there was a couple of people pulling up when I was there. They seemed quite busy there. But I mean, that's all I can tell you. Okay, if we can just break that down, because obviously, you know, you've spilled it out to us, and that's because it's all going through your mind. Well, what I mean, well, what I'm trying to say is that this is the day that I sold the car. The reason that I was over there was because of that reason. I was selling the car. I got into the Range Rover at Fobbin. They took, um, well, he gave me a lift round to her Pat's house, I think it was. And his girlfriend was in the car. Donna. Is it Donna? His girlfriend? Craig Rolf's girlfriend? Yes, it is. She was crying on the telly. She was in the car. Um, I went round to the house. Uh, there was another fella there. I can't think of his name. He gave me a lift back. He had like a creamy coloured car. I think it was a Fiat or something. He gave me a lift back. Okay, what I want to do is, as I say, is to try and break that down because we want to contradict me. No, no, honestly, it's to break it down a little bit so that we can understand it in small chunks. Mm. Because as I say, you know you were there and it's a case that you've got it straight in your mind. What we need to do is to get it straight in our minds and anybody else. So if you just bear with me a little bit and try and help me along. Okay. As far as you can recall, when was it that this took place? I really can't remember the date. I can't remember the date exactly, but I think oh, I've been over there a couple of times. I've been to his house, well, probably about three times, Pat, I mean. But I mean, the day that I sold the car, I met Craig at Forex Services. Okay, right. If we just take the meeting at the Forex Services, right, you know what day that was because you're telling me that you've seen me there. But Mr Bowman, I'm asking you as you know how it went down. I don't know what date it was though. Okay, so if we just deal with the Forex Services. Mm -hmm. Right, what car were you in? I was in the Carada. Okay, were you on your own? Yeah. Was there any other person present? Um, Craig and his girlfriend? What sort of time did you meet them? <laughs> I really can't remember the time. I mean, this has gone on, it's over three and a half, four months ago now. I couldn't tell you the time. I know it was the daytime, it was daylight. Okay, was it morning or early morning? I think it was morning, not early morning, but I think it was 11-ish. I can't remember though. You can't remember? Well, I can't, no. I can't be specific. I'm just trying to put you into some sort of time, whether it's morning, lunchtime, afternoon, evening. I think it was sort of about dinner time. About dinner time, yeah. And you travelled from where? From Kent? From your home address, Michael? Yeah, yeah, in the Carada. To take it to the fella, but I wasn't sure where it was. So you met Craig? Craig? Because he runs about for them, doesn't he? Yeah? Okay, how did you arrange to meet Craig? Um, well, Tony said, I think, to be there at a specific, you know, specific time. And Craig would be there. He gave me Craig's number, I think, and I rung it. Was that a landline or a mobile number? I think it would have been a mobile. Right, so you turn up there. Mm -hmm. Did you know what vehicle to be looking for? Uh, the Range Rover. 
Okay, then correct me if I'm wrong. You'd been in, you told us earlier that you were in that Range Rover. Mm hmm. Prior to that date? Yeah. Were Craig and his girlfriend waiting in the Range Rover? No. I think they was in the service station itself, but I got out and walked over and they come walking out. He seen me, then I followed them to Fobbin. Okay, was there anybody else present at the time? No. Any other vehicles? No. Did you consider about if you were going to sell the car that you may need a lift back? Yeah, I did, yeah. But they said they'd get me back there. Um, they had a friend of theirs over there, that way. So there's yourself in the Corrada. Mm -hmm. Then there's Rolf and his girlfriend in the Range Rover. Yeah, yeah. You meet them about lunchtime. Mm -hmm. And where do you travel to? To Fobbin, the car front. Right, is that the near the Five Bells pub? You know, the one on the side. Okay. Would that be the Eastern Garages? I'm not really sure the name of the garage. Um, I really can't remember. Is it the garage? It's like a little car front by the roundabout. Opposite, on the opposite side. Okay, so you travel there and who leads the way? Craig led the way. What sort of speed were you doing? Well, I don't know. Was it a fast drive down there or a slow drive or... Well, I really don't know. I didn't tear down there. No? One last drive in the Corrada? No, no, it wasn't anything like that. You know, I got the car there. I don't know what time it was. He didn't give me the check straight away. Right, and if we just slow down there, Michael. So you're travelling in convoy? Yeah. Okay, and it goes to the eastern garages? Yeah. Where did the car stop? Where did you park? I parked it right up in the little road. There's like a little road, um bit right by where his cars are. I parked it in there. And where was the vehicle? In front of or behind the Range Rover? I can't remember. I was behind him, obviously. I was following him. Okay, so you've got two people in the Range Rover and yourself in the Corrada. Mm-hmm. What happens then? Well, I get in the Range Rover with Craig. What was that for? Because I'm going around to see Pat and Tony now. Okay. Um, had you done the deal with the, with the salesman? Well, I'll give the fella a check. He was half moaning because he said he didn't really want to buy it and he was doing me a favour, you know, the usual car spiel. So I said, well, I'll come back and get the check and I went around to see Pat because it's his friend. What were the rough circumstances of the deal at the garage then, Michael? Just go through that. Well, I don't think the fella wanted to part with the cash, to be honest. I mean, I don't think he wanted to buy any more cars, to be honest with you. That's what I thought at the time anyway. But, you know, we did the deal and then I went around to Pat's. So did you negotiate it with him? That's the whole point that we're getting to. Yeah, well, yeah, he saw the car and he was going to take it, right? He wasn't happy. He was sort of, um, you know, just unhappy about it. But I got in the car and we went round to see Pat and Tony at Pat's house. Right, now slowly, where were you sitting in the Range Rover? I can't, um, I think I got in the back. And who was in the front? His girlfriend was in the passenger seat and he was driving. So you then drove from there? Mm-hmm. And did your business at the garage take very long? No, I wasn't there very long. I was coming back to collect the cheque, I think, if I remember rightly. So you then drive to Pat's house. And what was the purpose of that? I wanted to see Pat and Tone. I mean, I was over that way. OK, and what did you want to see them about? Well, I want to get a lift home. I want to get home. I can't get home. I've got no wheels to drive. OK. And I've got to collect the cheque as well. You know, I want to get home. One of them's got to give me a lift. It ain't illegal to have friends and go and associate with people, is it? No, no, no one's saying it is. But what I'm trying to do is to try and work out as you're telling me. Well, it ain't hard to work that out, is it? I've just told you I sold the car. I've got no car to get home. I'm going round there to see them to get a lift home. There's nothing going on. No, but could I suggest to you that Craig could have taken you from there straight home? No, he never. He never. No, I'm not saying that he did. I'm just saying that wouldn't it have been quicker rather than going to see the other two? Well, I wanted to see Pat and Tone. That's fine, OK. He was over there. He's only been out of prison a little while, hasn't he? That's right. So you drive to whose house? To Pat's house, the little bungalow. OK, and when you arrive there, mm -hmm, who's there? Um, the Black Merc was there. One of their mates pulled up, uh, had a creamy coloured saloon car. I don't know what it was. Might have been a Saab, I think. Saab 9000, something like that. Um, one of them sort of cars, anyway. I got out, went in there to see him. Did you know him? No, the other fella. No, I can't remember. I think his name was Tommy or something. Tom, Tom or something like that. 
little fella went in the house. I said, he's half hooting about this check, Pat. Pat said, don't worry, I'll give him a call. Because I said to Pat, this fella's half moaning about not buying the car. He's rung him up, had a chat, like a chat with him. And then he said he'd go round and collect it on the way. The other fella will give you a lift home. I think it's Tommy, his name. Got a Saab or a Fiat, creamy colour Fiat. I come out and got in the car with him. And what's he look like then, Michael? Oh, only short, little fella. Yeah. Age? Well, about 28. Young fella. I think one of their runabouts again. So who's in the bungalow when you arrive? Uh, well, the Merc was there. I think Tony was there as well because he had, uh, well, there was another couple of guys. There was Tony and his old woman was taking their stuff out of the house. Patrick's old woman was leaving the house. She had loads of bags. She was taking all her stuff from the loft. Pat was lobbing her out. That's when I started to see their true colours, really. He was taking her stuff out of the house. All her clothes. Um, I think it might have been her dad or her mum was there as well. So she was in the process of moving out. She's taking her stuff out, yeah. You know what it's like when you've got all that sort of stuff going on. I mean, I was only there probably five or ten minutes, top whack. I come out of there with a little guy. He gave me a lift down to the garage to collect the cheque, then back home to Ken. So you collected a cheque from, from the garage at Fobbing. And then he dropped me back through. I went back through the Dartford Tunnel and got me home. That was Tommy. Yeah. All the way home? All the way. Now, you've had time to think about it, Michael. Can you remember the guy's name that you dealt with at the garage? Uh, well, I know it's the governor at the car front. Um, I seem to remember Tony saying that they took the Merc and the Range Rover off them. So, and I think they owed them money for the cars. So when I've gone over there to sell the Carada, he was a little bit funny about the money. You know, but then Pat's rung up and it was all sorted out. Okay now, Mr. Bowman. Now, what I'm saying to you is that your account ties up around 95%, which is almost all of the account that we have. But there are some main areas where I'm suggesting to you that you haven't been totally truthful. Oh, well, I gathered it was going to be that way. No, but in all fairness to you, all I wanted to do was put some of those areas to you that we consider that you are either mistaken or possibly forgotten about, or that possibly that you don't want to tell us about for whatever reason. That's fair, isn't it? Well, I'm all ears. Okay, so when you arrived, and only you will know whether I'm telling the truth or not, mm. okay, when you arrived at Forex Services, mm. it was to meet Mr. Rolf and his girlfriend. Yeah, in the Range Rover. What I'm putting to you is that there was another person travelling with you in another vehicle. What do you mean? That you know there's another person in the car with me? No, in another car, another vehicle. So there's three cars there. There were three cars, hear me out. There was the Range Rover, yeah. There was your white Corrada, mm. And there was another vehicle, right. And what I'm suggesting to you is that other vehicle was a Vauxhall Cavalier. <laughs> no, you're mistaken, mate, you're wrong. I've just told you what's going on, right? That's all I can tell you. Well, we've got to put what we've got to you. I know what you've got to say. Look, listen, listen. Okay. As I say, these are the areas that we are not really touching on, on at the moment. And it's only right that I put them to you. Well, you've got to go through it. Right. There is a Vauxhall Cavalier. Mm. With you. No. No way. Okay. And that in the Vauxhall Cavalier was a holdall. Right. And that holdall contained a firearm. Right. And the reason that Vauxhall Cavalier contained the firearm was because you were going to the meet and didn't want to run the risk of being stopped with a firearm on board. No, you're mistaken completely. This is completely wrong. At the Furrock Services. Mm. You met Rolf and you, what you say is correct. You then travelled in convoy with Rolf driving the Range Rover in the lead, the Cavalier in the second position, and you at the back in your white Carada. And you travelled, as you quite rightly say, to the Eastern Garages to the Five Bells Roundabout Garage. What I'm also putting to you is that when you arrived at the garage, you parked, as you said, in that access road, right? Mm. In the order that you travelled there in convoy, you then removed a holdall from the Cavalier and placed it into the back of the Range Rover. Mm. What do you say to that? It's wrong. But what I'd like to do is show you the holdall so there's obviously no mistake about it, Michael, what we're talking about. What you're saying is, I carried a holdall. I'm asking you, I'm not telling you, I'm asking you what you did and what you did there. Well, you're telling me, aren't you? That I'm 5% wrong in what I've already told you, 95% of it's the truth. What I'm saying is, you're telling me that you've seen me with a bag. No, I'm not saying that at all. I'm trying to give you the opportunity to tell me. 
You don't have to give me no opportunities. I've told you exactly what's going on here. Okay. Right, hold on a second, Michael. Just have a look at this bag. That's the bag that we're saying that you had. A black and green bag. Well, look, I think that because you can obviously see the one that I'm referring to for the tape, it's exhibit GF slash six, which is a hold all bag. Now this bag has been obviously treated for fingerprints. All right, yeah which accounts for part of the discoloration on the bag. As far as we can see, that is. I'll get out the bag, but it is a bit messy, right? Okay, Michael, have you seen that bag before? Well, it's a sports bag, isn't it? I've seen loads of bags. Can't say I've seen that one. Well, no, that's why I'm asking you, Michael. Have you seen that bag before? Well, I can't say I've seen that bag before, no. No. So you haven't, right, okay. Because that's the bag that we're talking about, that we believe that the gun, the machine pistol, whatever you want to call it, that we'll show you a photograph of in a moment, that that was in this bag. Look, I can't tell you nothing about the bag. Right, well, what we're putting to you, there's loads of sports bags about. They're everywhere. Fair enough, but what we're putting to you, I go to the gym three, four times a week. I've got about four different sports bags that I take to the gym. But we're not saying that, Michael. What we're saying, but I'm just saying, I know what you're saying. We're referring specifically to that. I can't say that I've seen that bag before. No. Right, okay, Michael. What we're putting to you is that this was the bag that was in the back of the Vauxhall Cavalier. In the back of the Vauxhall Cavalier. Right, okay. Yeah, so you understand that, Michael, don't you? I understand what you're saying. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so you're saying that you've never seen that bag before. No, I can't recall seeing the bag there. Okay, now what I'm going to show you now is a picture of the pistol. So obviously the tape can't see this. So I'm now showing you a picture of the what we are referring to as the machine pistol. What you're saying, I supplied them with that. Hang on, just let me finish, please. This consists of the main basic body of the weapon, the moderator, as they call it, or the silencer. It has a magazine clip here with a cartridge in it or a shell in it and a quantity of shells around the bottom. I mean, obviously, if you wish to know the exact quantities here, I can tell you. But so that's the photograph. So that is the bag that we're saying contains that weapon that you have supplied to them on that date at the garage. No way. Have you ever seen this weapon before? I've never seen that before. No. It's amazing. I've supplied that to three people who've been assassinated. Have I? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Basically, I've supplied that to three people who've been assassinated. That's right. Okay. And as I say, Michael, we believe that that weapon arrived in the Vauxhall Cavalier, and that was with yourself and a person who was acting as the gopher. Right. That was then taken, as I say, to the Eastern Garage. Well, what colour was the Cavalier? What colour are you saying this Cavalier is? Why, is that some problem? Well, no. I said to you earlier there was a car outside the house when I pulled up. The fella gave me a lift home. It was a creamy coloured sort of fear or Saab. Would it help you if you knew what colour it was? Is this just a little test to see if we do know, Michael? No, I'm just saying, you know. Is it? I mean, if it's time to put the cards on the table, then it will be. If it's a testing question to find out. No, there's no question. There's no testing. There's no testing the questions at all in this interview. Right, Michael. The one that was there wasn't a creamy colour. The one that we're suggesting travelled in convoy. Well, well, no, I don't know what cavalry you're talking about then. Okay, when you got to the garage, what we're putting to you is that you got into the Range Rover, as you told us, mm. but also put into the Range Rover was that bag, together with that weapon and ammunition that you've seen in the photograph. Well, I did not see that, because I went in to see the geezer about the car. I don't know what you're talking about, I really don't. I got out, I went to see the fella about the car. He had a little look at the motor, that's all I can tell you. I did not see no bag going in the Range Rover. I did not see no Cavalier. So, no, I can't help you. I really can't. I really can't help you. Okay, Michael, now, why do you think, or perhaps you do know or don't know, why do you think that someone should implicate you with this illegal firearm? What you mean, what's my opinion of why they put it on me? I really don't know. Well, it's quite a serious thing, though, isn't it? Well, I mean, yeah, but for all I know, you might just be saying this. You might not have any information at all. Then again, you might have, but... What I'm trying to say to you is, I'm not responsible. Right, Michael. For supplying that firearm to those three people who are now dead. 
Fine, okay, right, Michael. Let me just say that we have a statement from a person who isn't a police officer. Right. Containing the information that we have given to you. But I can't understand why they'd say that. Look, just let me finish. I'm answering your question now to obviously allay your suspicion. Hmm. That we're either trying to trick you or it's a police ploy that we, you know, we're actually in possession of that statement. That doesn't make me feel like you're, that this is the truth, that that person is obviously lying. So they're lying about the meeting at the Forex Services as well. Well, I'm not. No, because I haven't denied that. I've told you that I met them there. Yeah, I, I can't understand why they're saying I actually give them that thing. I never give them that. Certainly, Michael, because as far as this offence goes, that's fairly innocuous, isn't it? You know, like the circumstances of the meeting in relation to handing over that weapon. Well, I don't, I don't know now exactly what's going on. As far as I'm concerned, really, uh, you know, my solicitor's here. I've asked him to be here. I really can't help you no more. I've told you everything I possibly can about what I've remembered. Um, I certainly don't, well, I most certainly didn't supply them with a machine gun, even though there's a machine gun that you've just showed me. And one way or another, I don't really want to answer any more questions because I feel like I've explained everything I can up to this point. And, you know, in all honesty, we're going around in circles now. No, we're not going around in circles. Well, I mean, you're basically calling me a liar. You're saying that someone's written a statement against me. No, Michael, what we're saying to you, and I don't really want to answer any more questions, to be honest. Look, Michael, we have a duty to investigate this offence and we just want you to tell the truth. I've told you everything. Well, I've told you everything. I can't tell you no more. I can't tell you anymore. What I've told you is what I know went on. I did not supply them with a machine gun. I went over there, sold my car, and I came home. That's it. I'm not going to answer any more questions at this stage. Is that all right? Can I do that? That's fine. My client has requested to answer no further questions. He is quite within his right to do so. Okay, Michael, that's fine. No one's trying to make you say anything you don't want to say. But as we've pointed out to you, we obviously have information. This ain't got nothing to do with my previous convictions at all, has it? It hasn't entered into your head for one moment that I've got firearms on my phone, then coming round my way this morning, dragging me out of bed in my underpants and things like that because of my previous convictions. Right, to answer that, Michael, that as your solicitor will tell you and explain, that we're involved in quite a large inquiry. Oh, I know you are. And we are. I really understand that. I said that to you earlier. Right, Michael, okay. I appreciate that you've got to go through every angle to find out who killed these three people, because whoever, you know, is a terrible, naughty person. The fella's dangerous. I understand that. But what I'm trying to say to you is you can't go around these circles trying to stick things on me. We haven't done that, Michael. Or someone has, you know, put it on me that I supplied them with that because, you know, their old man's dead or whatever, right? Okay, Michael, now before we conclude this interview, when we spoke to you originally, we asked you about your relationship with Tucker, Tate and Rolf. Yeah, well, I'm not going to answer no more questions at this stage, okay? But you can listen. When you originally told us, you said you were trying to distance yourself. I believe uh, you said it wasn't a very deep relationship. It was just that you met them a few times. That's what you told us originally, and I'd be interested to know when the last time you actually spoke to any of them was. This has nothing to do with a gun, has it? All right, look, that's what I'm trying to say to you. I've answered the questions about myself. I don't really want to start asking or answering any more questions about anyone else. I spoke to Pat the day before, the day before it happened. They've rung me a couple of times. They always ring me a couple of times a week, but that's it now, no more. Did you leave a message on their answer phone? No comment. If you'd like to learn more about the Range Rover murders as told in court, then please click on the video in front of you now. You'll also see the Essex Boys playlist, which has an array of separate videos regarding this case in one convenient folder. Many thanks for joining me for this video. I look forward to seeing you all again for the next one. Take care. Cheers.